session. Good morning and welcome to the sixth session of our Lunch and Learn webinar series for 2021. My name is Judy Cohen and I serve as the current president of the International Dyslexia Association, Florida branch. On behalf of our entire board, I want to welcome you to our webinar and thank you for taking time from your Saturday to join us. I also want to remind you that these webinars will be presented on the second Saturday of each month through November and recordings from previous sessions are available to view on our website. Our next session will be October 9th and we will share a recording by the late William Van Cleve. This session will be presented in memory of William and will focus on morphology. Please mark your calendars and plan to join us. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. Everyone is muted, but feel free to use the Q&A or chat tools throughout the session. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. The session is being recorded and resource documents will be available on our website, fl.dyslexiaida.org. Today's session is Instruction of Phonology and Orthography for Students with Dyslexia. And it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Paige Pullen, Chief Academic Officer, Language Center for Learning at the College of Education, University of Florida. Dr. Pullen joined the University of Florida faculty after 16 years at the University of Virginia, where she held appointments in the Curry School of Education and the School of Medicine. She was a public school elementary and reading teacher for 12 years, teaching students from diverse backgrounds and with diverse learning disabilities and abilities. Dr. Pullen is a member of several editorial boards and since 2010 has served as the editor-in-chief of Exceptionality and she is co-editor of the Handbook of Special Education. Dr. Pullen's research has focused primarily on implementing effective interventions for children with or at risk for learning disabilities, especially in the area of reading. She has worked with colleagues from the University of Virginia School of Medicine to provide effective health and educational services to children with disabilities, not only at UVA, but in rural Southwest Virginia, Virginia, and most notably in Lusaka, Zambia, and Gorobone, Botswana in Africa. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paige Pullen. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here. I'm, thank you, Judy, for the kind introduction. Um, it's a special day to be here with all of you as we remember um, September 11th. So I did want to just start with that and have just a moment of silence in recognition of the day we are honoring. Okay, thank you. I wanna start with our goal of the session today. And this was uh, in the uh, information that was sent out about the session. So teacher knowledge of English phonology and orthography is essential for providing instruction that works for students with dyslexia. What I'm hoping that you get today is some of the important features of the English phonology and orthography and how it relates to practicing, uh, you know, instructing in your students with dyslexia, um, but, but how, how these two areas really intersect to address children with, the, this, with dyslexia. Um, the session focus is on phonology and orthography. We know that there are many more aspects that influence reading comprehension and ultimately becoming a skilled reader. But we're going to focus on these six areas. We're going to review the Adams model of the reading process, particularly the phonological and orthographic processors, the phonological awareness, address phonological awareness and phonemic awareness, orthographic mapping, Aries phases of word recognition, and we're going to revisit the cueing system and talk about why it's not effective uh, for students, regardless of whether they have disabilities or not. 
as I go through this session today, I will stop periodically to ask for you to ask questions. So please feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is phonology and orthography. So reading is a complex task that requires the integration of multiple subskills, and these subskills must be implemented with a high degree of accuracy and automaticity. So we have reading skills, knowledge, cognitive processes, and language all work together. And when they're working together, then skilled reading is going to occur. So let's talk about what skilled reading looks like. Uh, in 1990, Marilyn Adams published the book, Beginning to Read, Thinking and Learning About Print. I still go to this book. In fact, I have it still by my table. It's still on my desk. It's still marked up with all kinds of tabs. And I continue to go back to that book to think about what it is that skilled readers actually do. Um, when we look at this model, we see that the first place that we enter in this process is the orthographic processor. Interestingly, when we think about students with dyslexia, we mostly think about the phonological processor. And it is true that many students who have dyslexia have deficits in this phonological processor. But the phonological processor is the second step in the skilled reading process. The first step is the orthographic processor. And we may be needing to spend a little bit more time thinking about this orthographic processor and how it links to phonology in the reading process. So in the reading process, as Marilyn Adams describes it, we enter the process of reading through the orthographic processor. So what happens, you see the word wind immediately or wind, we don't know what it is. You see these letters that goes into the orthographic processor. In your brain, your, your brain is processing every letter in the word. And they're going to, it's going, you're going to map a sound onto that word. Well, if we see this in isolation and we didn't have the context and meaning processor, what's going to happen is you're going to come up with two pronunciations. You're going to come up with a pronunciation wind or wind. And you see all the different sounds that are that are happening that your brain is processing. So we enter the orthographic processor, which sends information to the phonological processor, and those things are linked together. And then what happens is you have to make meaning out of that. Well, we may not be able to make meaning instantaneously without the context processor. So here we're, we're thinking of context. We have the sentence, and this could be either wind or it could be wind. What we know is that the context processor kicks in and after reading the sentence, it helps us determine which pronunciation is the correct one and then we have meaning. So in the meaning processors processing, my kite was flying in the wind. So again, the very first thing that we do is we process the print, the orthography. And so that is a critical piece in the, in the learning process in the reading process. I want you to think about that as it relates to learning to read. If the orthographic processor sends information to the phonological processor and then to the context and meaning processors, what does that mean for reading instruction? Where should we prompt students to focus their attention as they're reading novel words in print? So just hold that thought in, as we go through the rest of the session and we'll, we'll come back to that question. So the, here is some of the steps in the, here are some of the steps in the process. The skilled reader enters the process by attending to the orthography, the written letters. Through a process called orthographic mapping, which we'll go over today, the reader links the graphemes, which are the letter or letters, to their phonological representations. And then through phonological recoding, the phonemes are reconstituted into the whole word. So you take individual letter in the word, you map it to its, in its constituent sound, and then you push them all back together. That's called phonological recoding. So orthography is the letters, phonology is the sounds. Phonological recoding is when we reconstitute by putting those letters and sounds together 
the sounds together to make the whole word. Any, any questions? This is a very simplified explanation of the Adams model, but are there any questions about the Adams model so far? And I'll let Judy or Frank tell me if there are any questions. I so see we do have mostly, mostly lots of comments about how great that book is uh, and how people, can you repeat the title for folks? Beginning to Read, Thinking and Learning About Print. And it's then, not a new book, but it's still very um, pertinent to teaching students both with and without dyslexia. And then a question, and I don't know if you're, you're probably gonna, you might address this, uh, is how is orthographic mapping tested in school psychological exams to really see the deficits? We'll get to orthographic mapping in a little bit, but one way that we actually test whether or not children are using orthographic mapping is through nonsense word decoding measures. So when we actually assess children's nonsense word decoding, we are actually able to determine whether or not they are mapping on the, the grapheme or the letter to the sound and then being able to reconstitute it to say the whole group of sounds or the whole word or non-word. And so that's one way that we can measure whether or not a student is actually going through the process of orthographic mapping. Good question. All right, so let's think about the processors that we have. So Adam's model has four processors, the phonological processor, the orthographic processor, the context processor, and the meaning processor. So if you're a skilled reader, what's happening is you are using all four of these processors simultaneously. They happen so automatically that you don't even realize that you are attending to every letter in the word and every um, word in the sentence. You may think that you're reading in whole words and that you're seeing things in chunks and, and you do eventually once those are formed in lexical memory, but your brain, we know from eye gaze studies that you are actually processing every letter in a word and every word in a sentence. And when that happens, all of these processes are working simultaneously and you can see that you're just, your, your brain is trucking along, you're making sense of reading, um, and you are able to comprehend because you have all four of those processors working together. Now let's think about students with dyslexia. And this is something, this is where it might look different. So if you are a skilled reader, you're using all four processors effectively and efficiently and everything's working really well. What happens if you have a phonological deficit? What happens is it may slow down the process and you are having to work harder at those things. And so you're struggling. What if you have a two deficits? What if you also have a rapid automatic naming deficit? Then it makes it even harder. Um, another way to look at this example is, let's say you're a skilled reader and within the process of reading, there is a misspelled word. And this is one of the ways we know that individuals process every letter in a word. So you're a skilled reader, but there's something in the text that's incorrect, some incorrect spellings. Um, you're, you come across that word, it actually slows down the process and your eye fixates on that error for longer, even though you may not even realize that you read over the word and um, consciously, you may not even have recognized that there was an error, a misspelled word in the, in the passage. Um, so it slows down the process. We think of phonological, a phonological deficit in either phonological awareness, phonological memory, or rapid automatic naming. Rapid automatic naming is really one of the places where the orthography is going to come into play. Because what is it that you're trying to name or access from long-term memory? You're trying to access the letter and letter representations. And so although it is long-term retrieval, rapidly being able to retrieve information that's already in your, in your lexicon, um, that double deficit hypothesis where you have a phonological deficit, 
um, in two or more areas, it's going to make it even more complex for you to read. Um, so what is it, what implications might this have for reading instruction? And we'll be going through that as well. So let's talk about phonological processing. So deficits in phonological processing are clearly implicated as the most common cause of reading disabilities or dyslexia. It's a critical problem for a majority of cases of reading disability um, that are at the deco in decoding individual words or components of words. Deficit in some aspect of phonological processing that I've already mentioned, phonological awareness, phonological memory, or RAN, which is rapid automatic naming, are the most common causes of reading, dis uh, reading disabilities or dyslexia. So what is phonological processing? Let's talk about what it is that, that is a problem when a student has a deficit in phonological processing. First of all, we have what's called a phonological loop. That's a component of working memory that's involved, involved in storing phonological information. It contains two parts. It contains the phonological store and the articulatory control process. The phonological store is like a tape recorder or not a tape recorder anymore, um, something digital. We don't actually have tape recorders anymore, but it's like a tape recorder that retains the most recent two seconds of auditory information. What I think about when I think about the phonological store is when we used to go to the phone book to look up a phone number, and then we would go to the phone and call it, we would consciously say that number over and over and over in our head. We'd go to the phone, we'd make the call, and then that information is gone. So I want to order a pizza. I look up Papa John's. It's 9797272. And I say 9797272. I'm even just repeating it in my brain over and over and over again. I go to the phone. I dial it. I don't need it anymore. I throw it away. That phonological store is that ability to retain information for a short period of time, long enough for you to be able to use it. The articulatory control process can refresh information in the loop so it can be stored for longer than two seconds. So if you, um, oops, I'm sorry, I, are you all still seeing my screen? Yes, okay. Somebody just called me and it kicked me out of my um, screen. So let me just go back to meeting here. It's not cooperating. I can't see the, PowerPoint. So I'm going to stop sharing and then share again. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so there are see if I can hold the information for longer than two seconds of where I was before that happened <laughs> with my computer. So the articulatory control process refreshes so that you can hold that information longer and are able to use that again. How does that work with decoding? You can drop it in the chat. How would that impact decoding if your phonological loop, the phonological processing, either the phonological store or articulatory control process is not working as it should, what would happen to the decoding process? Feel free to drop some comments in the chat and I will then let Judy or Frank um, tell, me what, tell me what they see. So we have one comment that says, um, holding the sounds together to put the word together. So like a blending problem. Mm -hmm. okay. um, decoding becomes stilted. Another person says you have to remember this letter, for example, the chat's going really fast. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, well, this letter, for example, uh, that B is a B and it says B. Um, you cannot hold sounds to blend and read accurately. Another one child will not remember the phonemes he or she just segmented, thus cannot blend words properly. 
Some students may not retain earlier phonemes by the time they reach the end of the words, but I think we're getting a lot awesome. of it. You've got lot, yeah. lots of good information there. You're right on track. It's not very important for reading common known words, but in pairs decoding of new, more difficult words. And so if you consider this one, obviously, um, as someone said, if you're set, using the phonological store, and you are um, trying to get through this word, and you're you can't hold that those letter sounds in memory, you're not going to be able to remember what's at the beginning of the word before you get to the end of the word. That's why what we want to do instead of blending, of segmenting and then blending sound by sound, that we want to do a process called um, continuous blending. So you want to add on. So you in this case it would be b. Er, bur, burl, oo, burlu, and then hold that. G, ug, burlu, gug, n, burlu, gug, n, da, burlu, gug, n, da, plo, burlu, gug, n, da, plo. That's hard, even for those of us who are skilled readers, because it's a nonsense word. We're really having to use our orthographic mapping, and we're having to um, remember, if I did b, er, u, u, g, a, g, e, n, d, a, p, o, o, there would be no way for me to put that together. So, um, and, that, and that's without a phonological deficit. So when we have students with phonological deficits, and any student in, at all when we're reading, we want to make sure that we're doing that continuous blending, blend across the sounds and do additive. So you're, add it, you're adding each sound and repeating those sounds as you go through. Okay, here's, a, here's another one. And clearly these are examples that you're not going to see in text, but the idea stands that if you are trying to do this sound by sound, rather than through continuous blending, it's going to be more difficult. And students with phonological processing problems are going to forget what they see at the beginning of the word and not be able to blend those sounds together. So good comments in the chat. So what, what implications does this have for teaching? When you get to words like that and B versus appropriate. So phonological memory is not that important for com reading common known words like that and in B, um, that's a light cognitive load. The word appropriate is a much heavier cognitive load. What we need to figure out is a way to lighten that cognitive load even for those longer words in print. So the Phonological deficits impair decoding of new words or longer words. So what do we do instead? We want to teach with systematic phonics that includes blending and segmenting of sounds, build automaticity with common, less difficult words, build automaticity with orthographic patterns. So or if when you we did a study, I think it was published in 2009, it's Hudson, Pullen, Lane, and Torgerson, where we looked at um, multi, a multi-dimensional view of reading fluency. And what we found is that when children had um, were fluent with orthographic patterns, they recognized common orthographic patterns in print, they read more fluently than students who didn't recognize orthographic patterns in print. So having automaticity not only with, um, with, with words, but of those orthographic patterns. So now let's move over to orthographic processing. Um, inter, in, in, as we think about orthographic patterns and orthographic processing, interletter associations speed the recognition of both regularly and irregularly spelled words. So what is that? What are interletter associations? Letters that are frequently seen together and experienced by the reader help consolidate the unit in memory. So when you see two letters that are that go together often, then that's going to speed the process of recognition of the word. So it's not just in letter pairs, it's also the frequency in which two letters would appear together. For example, 
the letter T is 50 times more likely to be followed by an H than an O. An O is the second most common letter that follows a T in English words. So what happens is the TH is an orthographic unit that will speed the pattern, uh, that will speed the reading of words that contain that letter pattern. Now, interestingly, um, when, you're, when you see a T, you automatically are going to assume that an H is going to be there because it's 50 times more likely to be the case. So recognition, the more you read and the more frequently you see these letter patterns together, the more quickly they're going to be consolidated in memory. And when we consolidate those letter patterns in memory, that's going to speed the reading of unknown words. And that is true for both regularly and irregularly spelled words. Let's consider two interletter associations, DR and DN. Which of these letter combinations is common in English? Go ahead and drop it in the chat. And I know it'll, it'll go quickly, but do you think DR or DN is most common in English? All of the votes are for DR so far. All of the votes are for DR and you're right, it is DR. Um, now I would like for you to just jot down on a piece of paper um, the first five words that come to mind that DN are occur, because DN does occur. I think I can actually see the chat. Okay, madness. Jesse came up with madness. Nice to see you here, Jesse. Sadness. Edna, is that from a, is that Edna, are you, is that your name? That was me. That was you. Okay. Splendid. Blend and tend. Okay. Those are not coming in nearly as quickly, I'm guessing, as if we started, if we did the same thing for DR. So now let's do the same thing for DR and see how quickly we can come up with words with DR. Uh, while we're waiting for people to enter the chat, there was a question in the Q&A. Uh, is there any way to strengthen the phonological store? Like a child who forgets the sound that they were just reading, even in short words. Um, so they're forgetting the sound of the letter? Yeah, so for example, a student who who is sounding out the word cat and gets k at, but by the time they try to blend, they've forgotten. Okay, so um, not that they're not remembering what the letter sound is, but that they've just forgotten what they segmented. Um, the best way to do that is through focusing on blending at the body coda instead of the onset rhyme level or the sound by sound level. So the body of a phoneme, of a, of a syllable is, um, let's start with the onset rhyme. We typically think of phonological awareness as you know, the onset, the intrasyllabic level is the onset rhyme, but I'd like for you to shift your thinking and think about it being um, both the onset rhyme, that's true, but also the body coda. So the onset is everything in a word that precedes the vowel. The rhyme, the R-I-M-E, is the part of the word that rhymes, and we think about using that when we think about word families. But in the example that Frank just gave, if you say k at, and you've forgotten the k, it's gone. So that just as we were talking about the phonological processor before with longer words, think about the same additive blending that you would do with long words with short words. The body coda of a syllable is the, um, the body is the initial sound and it's vowel and the vowel sound and the coda is the final sound or sounds. So in the word cat, cat is the body and t is the coda. So when we start blending across, you want to do k, a, cat, cat. You can practice that body coda blending 
and that's going to help with that continuous blending. So if I'm doing the word mat, instead of saying m at, I want to say m a mat mat. So you're holding that, you're you're grouping that um, initial sound or sounds and the vowel together. In a word like fast, a fast fast. So hold that initial sound with the other. Um, you guys are coming up with all kinds of great words. Um, did that answer that question that the individual had? Let me know if you want more information on that. Good. Okay. So now let's think about, um, you've just done this activity, words with DR and words with DN. Let's look and see what we see. So just, just as you found when I started making this list last night um, to add this slide to my presentation, um, we actually have a lot of words with DR and I was able to get come up with them pretty quickly. There's actually one word in here that has uh, two words that have both a, a, no, one word that, no, 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 I'll take that back. It starts a hundred, that's ND. All right, so DR and all of those words. Now let's look at the words that I came up with with DN and you all came up with more than that. But what do you notice about the two sets of words? In particular, what do you notice about the DN words? Uh, the D, the, the, they're separated, there's at, at a syllable break. They're at a syllable break, right? So they're almost all multisyllabic words. Um, and so that is actually a signal when we see a D and N together, those of us who have strong orthographic processing or strong orthographic knowledge without our even realizing it, when I see midnight, if I see DN together, I know that that's gonna be a break in a syllable. And I might be doing this subconsciously, but that is how the orthographic processing works for students who have strong orthographic processing, is that we notice these things automatically without, it's, a, it's at a subconscious level, but we can actually teach these skills systematically so that what you may be doing at a subconscious level, you can teach explicitly to students through a strong phonics program. All right, so let's take um, you know, adding the phonological processor with the orthographic processor. The phonological processor takes information from the orthographic processor. It responds with pronunciations associated with the letter or letter combinations. So in the example we talked about earlier, the orthographic processor looked at W-I-N-D, it pulled all of those letters from memory, um, it then mapped them onto the sounds and came up with two logical pronunciations, either wind or wind. Then we had to use context and meaning to know which one made sense in the sentence. But the orthographic and phonological processor used that information to come up with a pronunciation. Um, I want to talk before we get into the next piece, which is phonological map, uh, phon uh, orthographic mapping, is to talk a little bit about phonological awareness because there's been over the years since the National Reading Panel came out in 2000 information that's been. Um, or at least recently may be confusing. So phonological awareness is an umbrella term that incorporates in, in all of the abilities to understand the sound system of language. It's a conscious awareness of the sound system of language. We often conflate phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. And we often think that these earlier skills like blending words, blending syllables, blending onsets and rhymes is necessary before children learn how to use phonemic awareness or develop phonemic awareness. What we know is that phonological sensitivity, and we're going to use the word phonological sensitivity to the, for the larger units of sound, like word level, syllable level, intersyllabic level, either onset rhyme or body coda that we talked about, that's phonological sensitivity. What we really need to develop 
is phonemic awareness, which refers to the individual sounds or phonemes. So we want to focus on the phoneme level. Once students are in kindergarten, they should be focusing on the phonemic awareness level, even if they haven't mastered those skills in phonological sensitivity. The reason is because we know that it develops independently of phonological sensitivity. And I wanna give an example of, of two students. Let's say we have two students who are entering kindergarten. One student was in a pre-K classroom that focused a great deal on phonological awareness. They blended words, they hopped for the number of words and sentences, they did syllable activities, um, they did rhyming games, they blended onset and rhyme, they did all of this stuff. And you give them a test when they enter kindergarten and they are really solid on phonological sensitivity skills. So what are you gonna do? And right away, you're going to start focusing on phonemic awareness. Now let's take another student. Another student comes in, they haven't been, they've been to a different preschool that didn't do any work on phonological sensitivity and their phonological sensitivity skills are weak. These two kindergartners st start at the same time. Our inclination might be to start working on phonological sensitivity with the child who didn't get those skills in pre-K. Now let's jump to December, it's Christmas time. What is the difference between, um, what is the difference between these two children at, at Christmas time? For the one, if you started with phonemic awareness, you probably started with phonemic awareness and you quickly added letters to it. And by December, they're decoding at least uh, simple words, constant vowel, consonant, CVCC, CCVC words. Now you take the other child and you spent August, September, October, November, December, focusing on these word syllable onset rhyme body code level. And so they still haven't gotten to phonemic awareness. You have one child reading and one child is just getting to the phoneme level. What we're doing is we're perpetuating that gap between the student who had phonological awareness and the one who didn't. Instead, what we want to do is we want to focus right off the bat in kindergarten on phonemic awareness, because we know that that skill can develop independently of phonological sensitivity. Um, Jesse put in the chat that Susan Brady wrote a comprehensive paper on the updates. Uh, it's called, it's about alphabetics. Um, it's phonemic awareness and alphabetics. And that is in the Reading League Journal, but there's also online, at, in this, Jesse, this may be the one that you posted. Um, it's an extended version that gets into all of the detail about this. So if, if you want to look at that, you can actually look at the studies that Susan Brady e examined to determine that indeed we develop phonological sensitivity independent of phonemic awareness. So I wanted to throw that out. Any questions about the difference between phonological sensitivity and phonemic awareness? Okay, it doesn't look like there are any questions. If we need to come back, if you have questions about phonemic awareness, um, at the end, we should have time for questions. All right, so let's look at aspects of phonemic awareness. At the phoneme level, the two most important skills are blending and segmenting. So blending phonemes, as we said, m, op, blend that together as mop. But keep in mind that as we blend, we want to make sure that we are continuously blending and doing that additive model. So instead of m, op, that's fine to practice that, but then also go the step further and say, now let's let's do this the way we would do it when we read. Mm, ah, mop, mop. That's going to help those children who have difficulties in phonological memory to be able to keep that in their memory because they're they're linking it together. Okay, segmenting phonemes. You have the word mop. Let's say it sound by sound. Mm, ah. Those are the two skills that are most closely related to 
decoding. Okay, um, glad you like the explanation, Maggie, and I'm glad to see that you're here. Good, and it, I hope, hope it does clear up misconceptions. Um, so phonemes are the smallest units of spoken language, the individual sounds. Now let's get into orthographic mapping. You have symbols. You map the symbols to sounds. You put the sounds together to make the words. Let's think about this passage right here. You would need to know the symbols, the sounds, before you could make sense of those words. Let's listen to what this sounds like because we see the symbols. Now let's listen to the sounds. Okay, so we, we see symbols, we hear sounds. What's missing for us in this? Why, why can't we understand this? Or is there anyone on the panel who can understand it? No one's chiming in and saying they can. So um, what we would need to be able to do to read this is we would need to be able to take each of these symbols. This is an alphabetic language. Um, it's Urdu, which is a, in, um, yes, we need to know translation to, to the knowledge of our language. Before we even think about meaning, we'd have to have that letter sound correspondence, right, Iris? We would need to be able to map the symbol to the sounds and then be able to blend the sounds to create words. Even when we hear it, we don't understand it because we don't have a, a grasp of that language. So we need to know what, what sounds, what symbols represent what sounds. We need to know where one word begins and one word ends to put those sounds, you know, to, to, to map them on to the particular words. So clearly we're not able to do this in this language, but what I'm hoping is this helps us see the importance of mapping those symbols to the sounds. If we had pictures around this text, would we be able to read it? No, we couldn't go look at pictures and be able to make sense of this. We would have to have the symbols and the symbols and the sounds to be able to decode the words. So again, decoding, You've got the symbols, you match the symbols to phonemes, the phonemes map to words, blend together to make words. Now, how if we do this enough times, then we get automaticity in a sight word store. So you've got you start recognizing orthographic patterns, matching those to phonemes, and you build your lexicon. Now, what's the difference between where I have here decoding and automaticity and sight word store? Anybody want to drop it in the chat? I can see the chat now. So this is a great way to be, um, you know, go back and forth and not just me talking to you. What is, what is the difference between decoding as you see it here in this first line and then making decoding into automaticity and sight word store? Okay, chunks versus um, sound. So you're, you are gonna start recognizing those, those chunks, those patterns are gonna be, uh, in your lexical memory. The other thing that's going to happen is you're going to build your sight word store. Sight word knowledge is another thing that is often misunderstood. So many people think that sight words are those words that are irregular. So an irregular word would be a word that they're the most frequent sound for a letter isn't what's actually stated, what is, isn't what's there. A sight word is a word that you read automatically and that's in your lexicon. It's a, your memory of known words. That's absolutely right, Tori. So when you go through the decoding process over and over and over again, you eventually build automaticity and you build your sight word store. So orthography is the written word. 
phonological recoding, blending sounds together to form a spoken word, and then automaticity, consolidating those words into your long-term memory. Those known words are your sight words. The words that we often think about as sight words, those are called irregular words or high frequency words. Any questions about this piece? And Nora, you're exactly right. Phonemic proficiency leads to automaticity and blending, reading a word, a word becomes a sight word. Absolutely, you, you nailed it. Okay, no questions. Now let's think about what this looks like in terms of orthographic mapping. So this is what we're going to do instead of picking up a book, looking at it, and then looking at the pictures to free, so high frequency words versus sight words, right? So high frequency words are words we're gonna see often and we want them to become sight words, but they're sight words when they're in our lexicon. Um, we actually form that lexicon through a process called orthographic mapping. Orthographic mapping works through the process of phonological recoding that we've talked about before. We can't read a word without both orthography and phonology. We have to link the two for it to become a part of our lexicon or our store of sight words. So if we think of the word mapping, this is how phonological orthographic mapping works. We're gonna map the word mapping. M, A, P, E, N, G. We phonologically recode to form the word mapping, okay? Orthographic mapping leads to the sight word, to automaticity or your sight word store and automaticity in um, your word knowledge. So let's think of this word. Here's the word because. We're not going to find, we're not going to orthographically map it, but let's think about what happens when we map this word. We map the word because the first time. The next time we see it, we do it again. The next time we do it, the third time we've done it, by that time we have looked at the orthography, we've mapped it to the phonology and it goes into our lexicon. For typically developing students, one to four times is enough for students to actually consolidate that word in memory and put it in their lexicon in their lexical store. For students with dyslexia, they may need many more opportunities to go through that orthographic mapping process before it's consolidated in memory. So they're going to need more repetition than a student who is developing typically. Let's look about how this works with irregular words. You might be asking, well, yeah, that works for words that are regular, but what about irregular words? Even in irregular words, even though the spelling of a sound is not the way you would typically think of it being spelled, it's, a, it's an exception. <clears throat> you can still map it on to the individual sound, and that is going to be more efficient than trying to remember that word as a whole word. So you want to make sure that even with words that are irregular, you are mapping the phonemes onto the graphemes and then pointing out the grapheme that's different. But you're still gonna go through that process because it's orthographic mapping that's going to lead to words being consolidated in memory. But you're going through the same process. All right, so what happens if either phonology or orthographic knowledge are weak? Now we've already seen if we have no knowledge of the language in that Urdu passage, but this is a passage that you can read. Um, I think you can read most of the words. You can probably pronounce all of them, but go ahead and read this passage to yourself.
Okay, uh, hopefully everyone's had a chance to read this passage. Um, give me a thumbs up if you understand in, uh, in the passage. Can anybody understand the passage? Not seeing anyone understanding the passage. Nope, can't understand it. Um, okay, we'll look at the pictures and see if that helps. Did the pictures help? No. Well, you made a B on this passage because you read 80%. That's about a B, right? Is B work good enough? Okay, B work is not good enough when we read. 80% accuracy is what you're reading when you, only 20% of the words in this passage were changed. And when you take that 20% out, you see that reading comprehension breaks down. There's nothing we can do in terms of looking at the pictures or trying to figure out what this passage means. And it is not going to be an appropriate level for you to provide instruction. Kids are just going to be frustrated. Somebody mentioned frustration level. Absolutely, yes, I just gave up. Um, you might've even skipped the words, but the words that were, the 20% that were misspelled are likely ones that hold a lot of the meaning. And looking at the pictures does not help. Okay, um, so knowing that, we're going to talk about a second theory. We talked about Adam's model of the reading process. Now I want to talk about Aries phases of word recognition ability and how we're going to help students move through these phases using the process of orthographic mapping, focusing on phonology, and moving through from a non skilled reader to being a skilled reader. So we know that there are. Thanks, thanks to Linnea Airy, who, who coined the term orthographic mapping, and who also taught us about the phases of word recognition development. When young children start looking at books, they're at the pre-alphabetic phase. They are using pictures and looking primarily at pictures, and if they're saying any words, it's through complete um, logographic, looking at, looking at a word as a whole, they're not using any of the phonological information. They then move to the partial alphabetic phase where they're beginning to learn about letters and sounds and making use of those letters and sounds, but still that's not going to provide you any way to read a novel word in print. You might be looking at the first letter and then guessing. And we wanna take guessing out of reading. Guessing is not a part of the reading process. The next phase is the full alphabetic phase where you're able to attend to each individual sound in the word and phonologically recode to build the word. Once you have facility with that, you move to the consolidated alphabetic phase where you're starting to learn more about that orthographic knowledge and consolidating those orthographic units in memory and eventually become a skilled reader at the automatic phase. Now, to be clear, these are in an order, but they're not discrete from one another. It's not that you're pre-alphabetic and you suddenly jump to partial and you suddenly jump to full and then you suddenly jump to consolidated, particularly between the full and consolidated um, in that this is a process and this is overlapping. So even while you're in the full alphabetic phase, you are going to start developing that orthographic knowledge where you're consolidated, you, you, consolidating units in memory. And eventually you get to the automatic phase. So we're gonna go through these one by one. So in the um, pre-alphabetic phase, you're using visual cues and you're looking at words almost like shapes or logos. It's semantic or meaning-based rather than phonological. And the connections that you're making are entirely arbitrary. There's no systematic relationship. So you might um, see an Amazon box on the uh, front porch that many of us are probably seeing these days since during COVID, I'm sure that's increased. Or maybe you look under the Christmas tree and you find your name. 
um, and you know that that's your name, but you're looking at it as a whole unit or the most common one we think about is um, the McDonald's Golden Arches. If we, if we continue when children are at the pre-alphabetic phase and moving to the partial alphabetic phase, ask kids to look at the picture when they're trying to decode, what we're doing is we're actually increasing the likelihood that they're gonna stay in that pre-alphabetic phase for longer than we need them to. We want to do, in our reading instruction needs to propel them through these processes and make sure that they are, that we're taking the guessing game out and that they're using the print, the orthography and the phonology to read the words. So in the pre-alphabetic phase, you have an emerging use of grapheme phoneme connections. That's called phonetic cue reading. There are connections between graphemes and phonemes, but their graphemes and phoneme connections are incomplete. It's more reliable than visual cue reading, but still provides no way to read novel words in print. So in this example, the child might look at the dog and they might say, this is a white dog because they know that they look at the picture, they know it's a dog, they see the W, they say the sound and then they guess. Let's think about how that differs in the next phase, which is the full alphabetic phase. In the full alphabetic phase, words are accessed through phonological recoding. The graphemes or the letter or letters are converted into phonological representations. It's more reliable than phonetic cue reading, but it's not as um, effective as the consolidated alphabetic phase. In this case, the child, instead of looking at the picture, might look at the word black and say b, o, a, k, black. Or if we've taught them to continuously blend, they would probably say b, o, black, black, black. This is a black dog. Now we get to the consolidated alphabetic phase. And this is where the orthographic knowledge is really coming into play. Books are, um, books are becoming more complex. There are multi-letter patterns that are consolidated in memory and readers use chunks to decode rather than individual phonemes. Now, keep in mind that they are using chunks to decode, but we still, as Adams talks about, um, that we still, in our, in our brains, our eyes fixate on every letter in the word. So we aren't necessarily having to phonologically recode every single letter because we're starting to recognize those chunks. It is the most mature form of reading. Once you get to this point, then it's about continuing to practice, continuing to build that orthographic knowledge in your sight word store and becoming automatic. So let's look at this sentence. The new Boeing Dreamlifter is an, and then you get to two, challenging words, enormous freighter. Again, there's nothing you can do to look at the picture to figure out enormous freighter. Um, so what are some of the consolidated units that students would know? They would rec they might recognize O-R as OR, O-U-S, E-I-G-H, E-R. So those are orthographic patterns that happen in English frequently, and those are consolidated in memory that's going to make decoding more efficient. <clears throat> in the automatic phase, you have a highly developed set of strategies where you have accurate automatic decoding of unfamiliar words, and you use multiple strategies of decoding, structural and contextual analysis. And you're reading at um, an appropriate pace to facilitate understanding. You have reading fluency rate, accuracy, and prosody. And all of that ma makes up the automatic phase. So let's, um, let's stop here and pause for a moment for questions about the uh, Aries phases of word recognition development. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. So I've, I've, 
referenced this a couple of times, um, but haven't spent a lot of time talking about it specifically, but we're going, I, it, I can't do a session like this without mentioning it because it, it has been in the popular press a lot lately. But um, so what do you do instead of the three queuing system? Basically, that's what this whole session has been about, is what we do instead of using the three queuing system. Reading begins with orthographic input or letters. Orthographic input interacts with phonology. If you look for other information, so if you move your eyes off of the letters, then you slow down the process and are less efficient in building your lexicon through orthographic mapping. So when we ask children to look at the pictures or guess, we are actually encouraging them to use inefficient strategies and slowing down the process for them to build their orthographic knowledge through orthographic mapping. Does that mean that syntax and semantics aren't important? It doesn't mean that at all. Clearly, when you saw the Adams model, it is important that we use context and meaning. But let's think about let's think about how that works. If we were to go back to that Adams model slide, and I think I'll actually I think I've got time, so I'm going to um, actually do that. We're going to um, go back to this. Let's think of the process that that skilled readers use. They start at the orthographic processor. They move to the phonological processor. They get a pronunciation. It's not until they've actually used their, their orthographic knowledge and their phonological knowledge that they use context to determine which pronunciation, or in some case, it would be if the pronunciation, if there's only one way to pronounce the word, is the correct pronunciation. It doesn't happen until after you've processed the letters and the sounds. What we do when we ask children to think about these other things, these other what are what people have called cues, we are not helping them build their lexicon. What we want to do, and what you think about as a skilled reader, let's take this sentence, my kite was flying in the wind. Um, you're doing this automatically. When you get to the word wind, you have processed in your brain that it could be wind or wind, but your context processor clicks in at this point and determines which pronunciation it is. And your meaning, meaning processor and context processor work together to determine whether or not you've made a correct pronunciation of the word, not the other way around. So we don't use context to guess, we actually use context to confirm that the phonological representation that we've come up with is accurate. That's a lot different than using context to guess. So instead of using the three queuing system as equal parts in the decoding process, we're going to look at it a different way. We're going to direct students to decode the word through orthographic mapping. And the decoding is taking their orthographic knowledge and their phonological knowledge, putting it together through orthographic mapping. Then we're using syntax and semantics, the context processor, the meaning processor to cross check, confirm and self monitor and not the other way around. So these three systems, when you decode a word, aren't equal when you're learning to read. When you're learning to read, you're going to focus on phonemic, graphophonemic information first, go back and use syntax and semantics to check. Eventually what will happen is that it will become a part of a system that all works almost simultaneously. It's not exactly simultaneously because you do have input from orthography first. There's no other way we can do that. You have to enter the process through the letters and then the sounds. And then almost simultaneously, our context and meaning processors kick in.
So I'm going to stop here for a minute for questions and also um, open it up to, to comments or things about uh, how you, if you were to explain so, to your principal or to a new teacher who's coming into your building, um, what would you explain to them about the three queuing system? What's right about it and what's wrong about it? And you can just, I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to think about that and drop it in the chat. Uh, you might be getting into this, but teachers want to know the implications of not equating the three cues for using early pattern books with multi with multi-syllable words. Um, Jesse, tell me, tell me, can we take Jesse off mute and can you ask, tell me exactly what you mean? You should be able to, yeah, you should be able to unmute, Jesse. I may have gotten to it, but I'm not sure. You can't access your mic. Let me see if we can unmute you. Um, Frank, as the administrator, can you unmute Jesse? I just promoted him to panelists, so he should be able to. Let's see if I can do that. All right, well, let me just see if I can read your question again. Um, the implications of not equating the three cues for using early pattern books with multi-syllable words. So um, if you had, so first of all, let me, let me, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to get Jesse unmuted, but one of the things that I could spend a little bit of time talking about is text in general. Um, so text in general, in terms of should we use books that have pattern you know, that have those patterns, repetitive, repetitive patterns, etc. Uh, should we only use decodable text? You know, how do we select text? First of all, what may be a surprise to you is that we don't have evidence either way for decodable text. There is nothing in the in the extant literature at this point that confirms that using only decodable text with early readers is the way that we should go. Um, on the other hand, there is no information saying that we should only use authentic text. So if we go back, I'm gonna go back to another slide and let's see. Let's look at this slide. So um, if we have books that are not decodable, does it mean that you can't teach kids to map orthographically? No, we can. And in fact, we need to because not every word they're going to get when they read a, a book, they read authentic books, is going to be a perfect match in terms of decodability. Does it also mean that we shouldn't practice the skills that we have in decodable text? Not at all. So my best answer for the type of text we use is going to be based on the purpose for reading that particular text. If your purpose is that you've just taught a particular phonics skill and you want children to pack, practice that in text to focus on the specific skills that you've taught, then you want to use decodable text. If you want to teach kids to move through Aries phases of word recognition ability, knowing that there's going to be irregular words in that, and there are, by the way, temporarily <laughs> and permanently irregular, um, then you want to have, have opportunities to read books that are authentic. Um, now, in terms of um, 
do we read books with patterns and multi-syllable words? I think, Jesse, you can come off of mute now. So let's give it a try. And can you explain what your question is a little more? I'm not following. Sorry about that. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh -huh. Okay. I was having some, uh, I'm, I'm on my phone and I'm, I'm in a, um, I'm, at, I'm in public here. So um, the, the, the use of, of early pattern, like Fountas and Fennell style A through D books that, that, um, will expose children to multisyllabic words or other words that they haven't learned the phoneme graphing correspondence for with, with heavy picture support of the word that, uh, that the student you know, has difficulty decoding. I'd, I'd like for you to talk about um, what, if any, uh, place there is in early reading instruction for those types of pattern books. Okay, so um, thank you, Jesse. So, I think I, I sort of just hit on that in terms of what place there is. First of all, it's not that every book that is leveled A through D is a book that we shouldn't read. Those are books that kids can access. You can read those books. There are words in there that are irregular words and you can teach kids how to, um, how to orthographically map in those books. It's not the books themselves that are a problem. It is the way we use those books in our instruction. So if, if one of the things that's going to happen is if you're teaching, you're going to, um, through this method where we really are focusing on letters and sounds and building their lexicon, they're going to move through those early levels pretty quickly. Um, what you don't want to do is focus on those patterns and you don't want to um, rely solely on books that have patterns in them, but the patterns in, in and of themselves are not bad. If you teach, oh, I can read this page, uh, I'm actually gonna flip to a different, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment. I'm gonna flip to a different book, I'm a different PowerPoint to show an example of this. I think we've got time. Thank you for taking the time to do this, Dr. Pullen. I know this is, it's kind of a, it becomes a hot button issue in, in a lot of schools and in our, you know, in our current sort of uh, conversation. So this is very helpful. Sure, no problem at all. Um, I started to put some of these slides in and I thought I had too much, but I might, I think we've got time to do it. So I'm just gonna, if I can find a PowerPoint with that in it, um, I'll do so. I think I know just the one, if I can put my hands on it. Let's try this one. All right, let me put this in present. Oh, share my screen first. Okay, so I'm a little off script here, so forgive me. And Jesse, I believe this is one that I did for um, Pinellas County. Um, yeah, the look, it looks familiar. It's a, it's a great, yeah, it's a great uh, series of slides. That's perfect. Okay, is this kind of what you were thinking? All right, so how do we teach research-based um, effective prompts? So again, if we go back to this idea of the common practice and its relationship, this particular presentation was more broadly on the science of reading, not just about orthography and phonology, um, but it comes down to what we know in the science of reading. And what we know is this old system as you, of using graphophonemic, semantic, and syntactic information as equal partners in learning how to decode 
that that is not true. So instead, as we've already talked about, what poor readers do is they actually do exactly what we've been talking about. Um, they get to a word they don't know, they look at the pictures, they skip words. Um, that's what poor readers do. What good readers do is they decode through graphophonemics and then they cross, for, cross check, confirm and self monitor to make sure that what they read makes sense. Now let's look at the types of books. Um, you know, if we reconsider these multiple, multiple sources as we've described, this is how we're gonna do it. And let's look at, um, these are some of the prompts, but this is not, okay, this is what I wanted to show here. All right, let's look at one of these pattern, pattern books. Um, is there a place for a book like this? Okay, you can see, I see red, I see, you know what to say without even looking at the word. Blue, they're not gonna be reading the words. I see. Now let, let's look at the difference between these four. I see yellow, I see green, I see orange. Now look at the last one. In the last one, what we did is we covered up the picture and now what are you required to do? You're required to actually use orthographic mapping to figure out what that word is. So poor readers do what you see on page four, five, and six. If we use books like this exclusively, what we're doing is we're perpetuating what poor readers do. Now, what you could do is you could use those books where you tape a flap and you then lift up the flap so that they confirm. That is then teaching them to decode and then using the pictures to confirm. That's what skilled readers do. So on this last page seven, that's what we did. We covered up the picture and now we're gonna have the student read, I see b -r -b -r -ow brown brown. Then, you take off the picture and now check, are you right? Could that word be brown? What if they said, what if they said black because they just guessed that they're at the, at the partial, partial alphabetic phase, um, then you can say, well, this word does start with B and black starts with B, but we need to look at every letter in the word. Let's say the next sound, put those together, and then you could prompt them, O-W make one sound, it's ow. Let's do that together, say ow. Now let's add it to the brown, brown. Let's check to see if you're right. You're right. Um, so is there a use for this book? It depends, it's not that the book is wrong, it's, it's how we use the book. I would not encourage you to use books that are this repetitive, that focus so much on the pictures for an extended period of time, but there are certain ways that you can use them so that you're focusing children's attention to the letters and sounds. Does that help, Jesse? Yes, that is that is very helpful. And I know I know teachers are teachers ask this question all the time. And so I think that that does a really good job of illustrating text as tool and, and teacher skill that's needed to, to teach. So can I ask a question, Dr. Yeah. Pullen? Yes. Um, the question would be like, let, let's talk about brown, for example. The word brown has a consonant blend, and then it's got a, a diphthong, a vowel digraph diphthong, which would be pretty far down in the instructional sequence. And this looks like it might be like a level A book. It's probably, right? it's a level one. Yeah, so, so, you know, for example, in terms of orthographing, for, for, for my instruction, I wouldn't even introduce that OW says ow or that, the, that the, the two ways to represent that sound are OU and OW until later down in the road. So if, for example, color words are somehow really important for young students, then how do we do that without doing sight word training? So what I would do here is the way I just described it as yeah. I would model it. And I wouldn't expect for them to remember the OW, uh -huh. but they're going to, there are going to be words that they're going to come across that are temporarily irregular. That means uh -huh. they haven't learned the sound spelling relationship for that particular word yet. Uh 
And it's going to happen in books that they read. We're not going to control for every single word that they come across. So they're going to come across words that have letter patterns that they haven't experienced yet. What I've just done by modeling this and the consonant blend, by the way, if they know b and they know r, then they can blend r, and we don't need to teach it separately as a consonant blend. We have, you know, 44 phonemes and then like 52 blends and then you add you know, digraphs and diphthongs. And if you start teaching each of those individually, and when you can say in two consonants and blend them together, that's really the skill we want to teach. So the BR is not as much of a problem. Uh -huh. The OW, you just tell them, you're not going to ask them to guess it. You're going to say OW and this word says OW. So this is how I would do it. The R, R, OW, Brown. You've just modeled for them how to map orthographically that word. So um, it's, it's less, it's less about that. I mean, in orange, you can't, I mean, that's going to be really difficult to, to map orthographically. So I'm not sure that I would use this, this particular book. I probably wouldn't use um, for the youngest readers. I would might use it in preschool for learning print concepts and other things and giving, getting that opportunity. But when you start to teach decoding, it, it still is about how you use the text that you select. And you're, and you're going to select text purposely for what it is that you want to teach students. Um, so you can look at all the FNP books you have in your classroom and there are gonna be some good books that you can use. And it's not that just because they are leveled means you can't use them, but you want to, to pick them based on what the students know and need to learn. Um, and we want to help them decode, even if we're doing it through modeling, because remember, every time they orthographically map that word, every opportunity that they see that, if they map OW, that's going to start becoming a consolidated unit because that's one opportunity to see that unit. And every time they see OW says OW, that's going to be one more repetition, one more repetition. And then when you teach it, um, it, it may come quicker. So it's not that we want to eliminate the opportunity for children to see some of these more sophisticated units, um, but we're not gonna teach them. We're gonna teach them systematically and we can model through that. We had a question earlier in the chat and that was repeated in the Q&A. Um, Nancy wants to know, once a child can decode, how do you get them fluent? I like the repeated blending, but beyond that, what can we do? Well, um, so fluency, so there's automaticity at the word level, and then there's fluency, rate, accuracy, prosody. Um, so the way that we get them fluent is to continue to practice. Practice reading as a fluency with any skill. My son plays the violin, and so with the violin, um, he might have learned a particular um, finger fingering. I'll get this wrong because I don't play it, but... Um, he may have learned specific notes and where those are on the fingerboard, but he's not going to be fluent with those until he practices over and over and over again. So just because you can decode, remember when we looked back at, um, let's go back, oh, this, I'm in a different PowerPoint now. If we go back to that slide, because the more opportunities you have to orthographically map because, that's going to be consolidated in memory. So you want to make sure that students are having the opportunity to practice the skills that you've taught them. And that is where decodable text comes in. If children are reading independently and you want to, them to practice to build automaticity with those specific skills, then they can practice in decodable text. But fluency comes through um, repetition, practice, and it comes um, through reading with an adult with corrective feedback. That's another key. So it's not just practice, it's practice reading, reading with a skilled reader, preferably an adult with corrective feedback. So there was a, um, in 2008, may have been 2004, but anyway, since the National Reading Panel came out, um, a meta-analysis on different strategies for increasing reading fluency and repeated reading was one of those strategies. However, the differential in terms of the effect size was pretty substantial when it was practiced with or without an adult. So what I'm not encouraging is kids who are still trying to learn how to decode and build automaticity to, 
to use time in school for something like um, sustained silent reading. What we know about sustained silent reading is that kids typically are experts at looking like they're reading when they're actually not. So we want to increase the opportunity for children to read with an adult and provide that corrective feedback so that they can become fluent. Okay, does that help answer that question? Actually, let me pull my chat back up so I can see. Yes, so the, I can't remember off the top of my head what the effect size was, but um, the effect size was significantly different when um, it was reading with an adult with corrective feedback than just reading. I mean, independent wide reading is going to be helpful um, once children are consolidated and automatic phase. The independent wide reading that is going to be helpful when students are younger is when they read with an adult or even if they listen to, children, to, to models of skilled reading. Thank you, Nancy, I'm glad that was helpful. All right, here's another example of a book that um, is, you know, where the picture cues, this is another level text. Um, this one is not a decodable text, but many of the words in this text can be decoded um, and mapped orthographically. So nonetheless, we still have to use the words to figure out what the picture pictures are. Um, I'll get to that IEP accommodation question in just a moment, um, but let's look at this. It was a blank and the sun was out. It was blank and the sun was out. What could this word be? Robin felt splendid. She strutted on the blank. She sprinted on the blank. Okay. Some of those you could probably use the picture, but you could have also said summer. It was summer, it was spring, it was splendid. Um, grass, you probably could get. She strutted on the grass. She sprinted on the wind, that would be almost impossible. Um, it was sunny and the sun was out. Yes, mm-hmm. Um, Um, okay, so in terms of the corrective feedback being an accommodation, corrective feedback, so if we think about explicit and systematic instruction, and I have a paper, I'm happy to share, it's a chapter, I'm happy to share it with um, Frank and Judy and they can, they can share it out or put it on the web, put a link on the website. It's about, um, it, it's really it's really about the RTI process and what the general education teacher is uh, reasonably able to do in the general education classroom in terms of supporting students. And it, it looks at, it's called what is special education instruction? And what special education instruction is, is by law individualized instruction that it provided by a teacher who is prepared to provide that specialized instruction and it's based on their IEP and um, individualized to their needs. So if we think about what that in, encompasses, special, uh, special ed instruction means that it is systematic, explicit, reinforced, corrective, um, and intense. So we are increasing the intensity. That can be based on um, pace, rate, group size, duration. Um, it is corrective, meaning that we are providing that corrective feedback. It's reinforced, meaning we're reinforcing what the student does correctly. It's systematic, meaning it's based on a, a scope and sequence, a series of um, 
steps that build on one another and explicit, we're making it very clear and not leaving anything to chance. We are, we're putting it right out there. And so this particular chapter is, provides kind of a lexicon of what each of those pieces of special education instruction mean. So by nature of special, special education instruction, special education should be corrective. I would argue that we should provide corrective feedback to students, whether they have disabilities or not, but certainly you could list that as a requirement on the IEP that they need to um, engage in X number of minutes per day with an adult reading with corrective feedback. And that could be a, a strategy on the IEP plan. I'm not so sure it would necessarily be an accommodation so much as it would be a strategy. An accommodation might be um, that because students are decoding at a level that is below their language ability. So if we think about the simple view of reading, we think about um, you know, decoding, comp decoding ability and language comprehension. Their language comprehension, if you have dyslexia, you probably have language comprehension that's much higher than your decoding ability. So what would an accommodation be? We know that um, independent wide reading is where kids are going to learn more vocabulary, they're going to learn more background knowledge, those things that are gonna help them comprehend more difficult text later on, um, different language structures. And so an accommodation would be making sure that if they're in a group where you are like reading group and in their reading instruction, they're getting really explicit systematic instruction on decoding at their appropriate level, that their language comprehension is also supported through example of books on tape, making sure that they have access to good literature and are able to discuss that literature with the rest of the class that they may be missing out on because they're getting instruction based on um, this orthographic and phonological knowledge to learn how to decode and we don't want to leave out that language comprehension. I'm not sure that was totally answering the question, but um, hopefully that that gives you a couple ways to think about both accommodations and instruction for students with dyslexia or other disabilities. Okay, let me switch back to the other PowerPoint. I think I was about at the end of that one, but just in case, let's reshare that one. Excuse me, Dr. Paul, and this is Judy. There was a question on the chat if that other PowerPoint could be available as well. Um, or not, it's okay, just asking the question. Yeah, I can, uh, there's a lot of stuff in it that wouldn't necessarily make sense. And so what I can do is add those slides to this PowerPoint. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, also to that uh, person, the person who questioned whether that, uh, I was trying to respond, but this exact presentation, just as we're recording this presentation, so those slides, when you go back and, and watch the recorded presentation, the slides that Dr. Pullen showed we'll from the other presentation will be there, but they won't be the PowerPoint. It'll be the, yeah, it'll yeah. be the, yes, you'll see the slides from the, um, on the video. Good point. Thank you, Frank, for reminding me of that. All right, so my next slide was uh, comments and questions, and we have already gotten to a lot of comments and questions and taken us back to other PowerPoints and that sort of thing, but feel free to ask, to, you know, to ask other questions, um, and I'll do my best to answer them and may even go to a different PowerPoint. PowerPoint deck if necessary. So what other comments, questions that you have? Um, other things I can answer. Where is the line between failed instruction and dyslexia? That's a very good question. And that's one of the questions that um, RTI was 
supposed to answer, right? I mean, the whole idea of response to intervention was that we were going to make sure that students in special before they were identified as having a special you know, need having a need for special education services that their instruction was effective based on the science of reading or based on evidence-based practices not necessarily just reading it, it encompasses all areas of disability uh, dyscalculia you know, dysgraphia other other types of learning disabilities What's happened in practice is that because we don't have one single method for RTI and for identification of students with learning disabilities, what I have seen take place is that kids seem to move in and out of tier one and tier two, and they'll start doing well when they get that systemic, systematic instruction. But then when we stop that systematic instruction, they don't do well and we tend to leave kids in tier two instruction for a long time so the actual prevalence of learning disabilities has gone down uh, there's a paper published in journal of learning disabilities i think it was 2017 in that paper i actually look at the national survey of children's health data and osep data and parents were indicating at a higher rate that a doctor or a teacher or some professional had said that their child had a learning disability, but the actual services to students in schools has gone down. And then in another paper in 2019, we found that when that happened, that there was a distinct cutoff um, at the time that RTI was implemented, where not only did the, was that significant at that point, the decrease and identification, but the coefficient of variation, which means the variability among states, actually increased. So in other words, where it used to be pretty common across states, you know, the, the prevalence would be pretty similar. The variation among states now is much is much higher. So one of the things that RTI does, we think, um, the idea is that it is supposed to catch children before they fall, that we're going to, you know, not, it's not going to be a wait to fail model, but we're going to identify students sooner. And that may not be the case. And so now researchers are looking at different ways of looking at really sophisticated statistical models for identifying kids with learning disabilities, particularly reading disabilities, based on um, curriculum based measures based on patterns of strengths and weaknesses, different types of evaluations. Um, I think until we really are able to identify kids appropriately, will we be able to see the difference between what is, was this caused because of poor instruction or is this a um, true phonological processing disorder? If we look at fMRI studies, we can see the differences in brain activity, but you can't have every student have an fMRI to determine whether they have a reading disability or not. So, um, so I just said, yes, uh, um, somebody saying, you know, her child has been in RTI for five years and the school won't address it. And one thing that parents can do as part in the bylaw uh, is that you can require if your child is in RTI and you want them to be evaluated as a parent, you can request that evaluation outside of the RTI process. You can say enough is enough. I want my child to be assessed. So, um, so that's, that's one of the things is really advocating as specialists, you know, you're all specialists in your field, making sure that we aren't actually perpetuating this um, lack of identification of kids with dyslexia and that we actually are doing full evaluations to determine whether a child has, dys has dyslexia or not. Um, we had a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, one of them is a kind of continued frustration about the why is this information not filtering down to school districts? And Judy can address that because I think our organization, as well as 
the universities uh, are are working really hard to to get this at least to the state, uh, 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 so that they the, the, the individuals who are implementing policies at the state level, and then we have individuals advocating in, in their own districts. Um, but it's it's a it's a it's a long process that people don't understand why that this is this information isn't filtering down to school districts is one question. The other question is, I have students with exceptional needs who can sight read words without decoding. Do we have to teach them how to decode? Because that may present difficulty. They may present difficulty in re reading longer words. Yes, you need to learn how to decode. Um, so even though they have a, a large sight vocabulary, you need to go back and have them orthographically map some of those words to see why that word is what it is. And particularly for words that they don't know, um, map them orthographically through, you know, in longer words. I, this is something that I have not tested yet, but I have a hypothesis about. And it's a study that I'm hoping to embark on soon. And that is for older readers or readers who have already acquired some level of sight knowledge, sight word knowledge, but can we teach them um, to decode rather than starting at the very beginning, start with multisyllabic words. So you start with a multisyllabic word, you break it into parts. Each of those parts then becomes a small, either small word or non-word that then you orthographically map. And will that be more efficient for kids like you're describing? Um, so that's a study I'm working on designing now and hopefully we get some good information from that. And Jesse, I'll probably be reaching out to you to see if we can do it in Pinellas County. Uh, but, but we do need to teach them how to decode because if they can't, there's no way that you can learn all of the words that you need to learn by sight. It just is not possible. Um, Nancy in the Q&A indicated that morphology helps with that. Your morphology does help with that and that will be also be part of the study is if we break words into individual morphemes and then with each morpheme you map you orthographically map that morpheme to be able to blend and segment that morpheme and then that morpheme becomes consolidated in memory as well and then you that morpheme so you can read based on um, you know different syllable breaking syllables and uh, breaking a word into syllables breaking a word into morphemes and using that process of the orthographic and phonological knowledge for longer words. And then if you can get these you know, Latin, Greeks, uh, Latin and Greek roots consolidated in memory, then you're also helping with vocabulary and um, meaning as well. So lots of things we still have to learn. So that, that's a great segue into, um, into our, our next presentation, which is gonna be by William Van Cleve, deceased. We're gonna be pre uh, presenting um, one of his recordings next month uh, on morphology and the importance of using morphology and in instruction. So um, I'll let Judy take it over from there. Okay, well, first of all, I wanna say thank you so much, Dr. Poland. This has been absolutely fantastic. I could listen to you all day, but I understand you have other things to do today and so do the rest of our participants, but um, that was really exciting and so current. So we thank you, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. And I hope maybe we can work together some more because I believe what Frank um, was talking about is we really have to make a difference in our state so that we can work together, the different groups, the different universities, different organizations such as ours to make a difference for all kids in the state of Florida and beyond. And I think a lot of it has to do with teaching the general ed teachers how to teach reading in core one instruction. Um, and I think that's a big focus. Um, and I know with our organization, IDA, we are working on um, the importance of pre-service education teachers and you know how that impacts once they get a job and they're working in their classrooms. So um, yeah, there's just so much work we need to do. And I think
think my collaboration is the only way we're going to make it happen. So thank you again so much. And I want to thank um, all our participants for their attendance today. I want to say I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and we all did. And if you need any information about anything we talked about, anything that we can help you um, learn more, please, please contact me, contact us, visit our website. Um, we're here to help you. And I did want to just put a little shout out there. I looked at the list of participants and I did see some of our amazing FIU student teachers and teachers from my classes. And I saw some of our state regional literacy directors. So I think we have a really nice representation of participants. And now it's up to us to go out and share all this information. Um, the other thing is I just wanted to mention, as Frank said, uh, please mark your calendars uh, for October 9th at 11 a.m. Uh, we'll have our seventh Lunch and Learn webinar, and we will pre uh, present a recording from the late uh, William Van Cleve. And again, the topic will be morphology. Um, and not to take up any of your more any more of your Saturday. Thank you to everybody. Have a wonderful weekend and hope to see you next month. Thank you. And um, I appreciate being here. And I will just say this, as you talk about the general education teacher, the literacy matrix is the route to the reading endorsement, which has a lot of this information that I went over today in that literacy matrix and we'll be launching again um, end of October or early November. So if you're a teacher in the state of Florida who needs your reading endorsement, I highly encourage you to reach out. Uh, and the Literacy Matrix, which is sponsored by the state of Florida, I meet with the state of Florida uh, biweekly. So we are in talks and making sure that we're trying to do what's best for the, the children and teachers around Florida. So, so Judy, happy to collaborate and talk more about that. But we are working very closely with the state and the state department of education is really wanting to make a difference for kids and so really excited about that so we're in a we're in a prime position to really make a difference across our state all right thank you so much and um hopefully we will be collaborating very soon um, all I see in the chat is a whole bunch of wonderful thank yous for your presentation. So on behalf of everybody, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I hope we can, like I said, keep up this wonderful collaboration. And thank you, Frank, for your um, all your work on this. And um, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Take thank care. you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pullen. You're very welcome. I enjoyed doing it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.